Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Jean Reese's short story, The Day They Burned the Books. Um, this is a story set in the Caribbean. Um, I believe on the island of Dominica, where Reese herself was from. Um, although I actually don't remember that that's spelled out necessarily, but it's clearly set in the British Caribbean. Um, this is a, a story that's ultimately interested in the cultural authority of British colonialism, which is different from, but relate, intrinsically related to the political authority of British colonialism and the sort of racial hierarchies of the colonial system. So both the speaker of this um, story and also the friend Eddie are white, um, or at least Eddie maybe half white. It's not 100% clear because um, his mother, Mrs. Sawyer, is black or is of mixed race, at least. Um, and his father, Mr. Sawyer, is definitely white. Um, Mr. Sawyer hates the Caribbean. He seems to hate Caribbean people. Uh, he is definitely racist. Um, there is this bit here where he says some horrifically racist things to his wife, who, according to uh, the thing, says, uh, or who, according to the, to the narrator, says she would smile as if she knew she ought to see the joke, but couldn't. Uh, there's this bit where he pulls her hair as to sort of amuse his friends or some some bullshit like this. Um, and it says, but Mildred, who's the Sawyer's servant, told the other servants in the town that her eyes had gone wicked like a sucrecon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, but that would be a female vampire in Caribbean legend, according to the Norton footnote. Um, and that afterward, she had picked up some of the hair he pulled out and put it in an envelope. And that Mr. Sawyer ought to look out. Hair is obeya as well as hands. So there is this element of Caribbean mysticism, Caribbean folk magic, but also Caribbean folk knowledge that's set up in contrast to the knowledge of Mr. Sawyer, because he is a collector of books. He's a great collector of books. He builds this, um, this sort of library shed, library room out back of their house, and he collects up books. He fills his, his bookcases with books that are brought in from England. Um, this is really important. Books are an important component of, or were an important component of British colonial authority, British colonial systems. Um, Ngugi Watiango famously talks about this in his book, Decolonizing the Mind. Literature was used as part of what Ngugi calls cultural bomb that was intended to destroy um, African identities, Black Caribbean identities, and to establish the supremacy of British or classical European identities, the Greco-Roman literature, but also British literature. This was presented as the pinnacle of culture, whereas um, for Ngugi, um, Kenyan literature and culture, Gikuyu language, um, but for the sort of wider um, African languages, cultures, 
um, folk knowledges, things like this. Um, and for Afro-Caribbean languages, knowledges, cultures, things like this, um, literature was used to degrade those cultures and traditions and languages because the education system taught people to believe that British literature, English literature especially, was the pinnacle of culture, whereas African and African diasporic um, literatures and cultural traditions were presented as primitive, ill-developed, all this bullshit. And we get this moment very sort of directly evoked in Reese's story. Um, because the, the speaker of the story says, it was Eddie with his pale blue eyes and straw colored hair, the living image of his father, though often as silent as his mother, who first infected me with doubts about home, meaning England. He was so quiet when others who had, who had never seen it, none of us had ever seen it, were talking about its delights, gesticulating freely as we talked. London, the beautiful rosy-cheeked ladies, the theaters, the shops, the fog, the blazing coals in winter, the exotic food, white bait eaten to the sound of violins, strawberries and cream. The word strawberries always spoken with a guttural and throaty sound which we imagined to be the proper English pronunciation. I don't like strawberries, Eddie said on one occasion. You don't like strawberries? No, and I don't like daffodils either. Dad's always going on about them. He says they lick the flowers here into a cocked hat, and I bet that's a lie. We were all too shocked to say, you don't know a thing about it. We were so shocked that nobody spoke to him for the rest of the day, but I for, for one admired him. I also was tired of learning and reciting poems in praise of daffodils, and my relationship with few real English boys and girls I had met were awkward. I had discovered that if I called myself English, they would snub me haughtily. You're not English, you're a horrid colonial. Well, I don't want to be English, I would say. It's much more fun to be French or Spanish or something like that, and as a matter of fact, I am a bit. Then I took, uh, then I was too killingly funny, quite ridiculous. Not only a horrid colonial, but also ridiculous. Heads I win, tails you lose. That was the English. So what we see here is this, these sort of, dual elements of cultural superiority. On the one hand, people living in the Caribbean, like actually Reese and her family, who um, Reese's father, I think, was Welsh. Um, yeah, her father was Welsh. Um, her mother was from white. She was white, um, but she was from an old West Indian white family. Um, people in the Caribbean, people in the colonies in Africa, people in various places around the British Empire learned these British literary masterpieces like Wordsworth, for instance. Um, these people who write about English flowers, but it was a completely different world. To the world that that people in these colonies knew and there was this fetishization often particularly among um white people in the colonies and particularly among um indigenous people in whatever that that area was who aspired to positions of power or authority within the colonial hierarchy there's this fetishization of Englishness and English food, manners, clothing, um, <laughs> flowers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was completely foreign to what these people actually experienced in their own lives. And the thing that Ngugi basically argues in decolonizing the mind is that this fetishization was used to degrade and destroy local identities 
for people, um, Africans, African Caribbean people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so, in this story, the speaker is intuiting that is is identifying that cultural element where literature, English literature, is taught to people in the colonies to alienate them from their own experiences. And it seems that Mrs. Sawyer has a sort of intuitive understanding of this as well, because after Mr. Sawyer mysteriously dies, um, that's fine, fuck him, he was a terrible dude, it seems, um, Eddie more or less takes over the library until one day and says here, um, but there we are, um, but there we are and there unexpectedly are Mrs. Sawyer and Mildred. Mrs. Sawyer's mouth tight, her eyes pleased. She's pulling all the books out of the shelves and piling them into two heaps. The big, fat, glossy ones, the good-looking ones, Mildred explains in a whisper, lie in one heap. The Encyclopedia Britannica, British flowers, birds and beasts, various histories, books with maps, Froud's English in the West Indies, and so on, they are going to be sold. The unimportant books with paper covers or damaged covers or torn pages lie in another heap. They are going to be burnt. Yes, burnt. Mildred, Mildred's expression was extraordinary as she said that, half hugely delighted, half shocked, even frightened. And as for Mrs. Sawyer, well, I knew bad temper. I'd often seen it. I knew rage, but this was hate. So Mrs. Sawyer seems to have intuited the, the central role of books in the cultural superiority felt by English people over those in the colonies, particularly over people of color, and in her husband's racism. Now, Eddie does end up saving one book, um, Rudyard Kipling's Kim, um, and the the narrator saves one book, Fort Complement, by uh, Guy de Montpassant, or Strong Strong as Death in the is the English title, um, and they sort of run off with these books and they they rescue them from the burning. Eddie rescues Kim because that was the book, that was a book that he had been reading, but the narrator rescues a book at random. And there's this interesting, really interesting moment at the end of this short story. Um, Eddie asks, um, what's the one you took? The narrator says, I don't know, it's too dark to see, I said. When I got home, I rushed into my bedroom and locked the door because I knew that this book was the most important thing that had ever happened to me, and I did not want anybody to be there when I looked at it. But I was very disappointed because it was in French and seemed dull. Fort Comblement, it was called. And that's this just really fascinating moment in which... Right, the the hope there, the premise, and as an English major, I can I can definitely relate to this. The hope there seems to be that this book will somehow save the narrator, will somehow be this liberation from the small mindedness, the pettiness, the racism, the colonialism of the world that she comes from. But the book itself, because she doesn't read French and because it doesn't seem interesting, the book itself becomes worthless. It is a profound disappointment at the end of this story. <laughs>